am on the battlefield for my Lord. We might as well have some church. Oh, I am on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. And I promise him that I said it, I said. Oh, I am on the battlefield. So glad that I'm on the battlefield. For oh, my Lord, oh, I am on the battlefield. For oh, my Lord, for oh, my Lord, and I promise Him that I said it, I serve till I die. I am on. You know that I was. Alone at night, oh, and I was a sinner too. Oh, but I heard the voice from heaven saying that. Oh, but I took my master's hand and I joined. Oh, I am on. You better sing, Uncle Dave. Oh. Hey, so glad that I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, I am on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. And I promise him that I said it, I serve till I die. I am on. I love this verse. Oh, when I left my friends and kindred, I was bound for the promised land. Oh, the grace of God before me, the Bible in my hand. This distant land I tried, crying sin up, come to God, I am on. Hey, it's so glad I'm on. Oh, so glad I'm on. Battlefield for my Lord. Sing, Uncle Tank, come on here. Oh, I promise him that I, I said that I promise him that I, said that I promise him that I, you can dance if you want to, I promise him that I said it. I promise him that I said it. I promise him that I all oh, that I promise him that I said it. I promise him that I all oh, that I said till I die. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Yeah. Yeah! Oh yeah! Oh It's what I do. Oh, praise is what I do. What I do. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I do? I ain't asked you what you think. I'm talking about what you do. Praise is the word I do. What I do. What I do. Hey, yeah, hey, is what I do. When it don't look too good. Praise is what I do. It's what I do. It's what I do. It's what I do. You can take everything I got, leave me with everything that I have, but when I ain't got nothing else, praise is what I do. We do thank and praise God for our being here, Pastor Ross, Lady Ross, the entire King of Connections family, and then to my wife and daughter family, we are blessed to be here. Amen. The atmosphere is set for the receiving of the word. Book of John, John chapter 9, John chapter 9, amen, John chapter Nine. I don't know if it's the spirit of God or if them Polishes ain't he caroling cooked last night, but the Lord doing it up in here. I mean, praise the Lord. John chapter nine, verses one through three and verses six through nine. John chapter nine. Verses 1 through 3 and verses 6 through 9. If you got it, say, I got it. I ain't waiting on nobody else. John chapter 9, uh, verse 1. The Bible says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this, neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Drop down to verse six. Verse six says, when he has spoken thus, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which had seen him that was blind, said, is not this he that sat? And beg, some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. I know that's, part, I know that's the shouting part, but let me, work on, let me work on verse 2. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents that he was born blind. I want to encourage and to enlighten you on today from this thought. Things are not always what they seem. (laughs) Things are not always what they seem. Just encourage somebody and just tell them things ain't always what they seem. No, no, no. I know what it looked like. I 
know what it appears to be. I know from looking at it one way, this is what it could be. But what you think it is, that's not what it always is. I'm going to say something. I hope you all are thick-skinned enough to handle this. Um, I, I, I pray that after making this statement, y'all will still love me. I may not ever preach at this place again. I hope Daddy Ross still loved me. I hope Mama Ross still loved me after I say this. But if I can just say this, being on both sides of the fence, um, church people are the most judgmental, yeah. indecisive, overly emotional, hypocritical people on the face of this earth. We talk about how bad Trump is, but y'all never talk about how bad, bad you are. You, you never seem to talk about how messed up your mindset is and how you do, do stuff and how you look at stuff. And even when you're wrong, you just don't want to be in the wrong. Even when you know you are wrong, it's hard for you to accept the fact that you was wrong. You may not have been right, but you don't want to be wrong. Many a times because of how we so much in ourselves, it's hard for us to really see things for what they really are. And, and it's been said for years that you should never judge a book by its cover. And we do it. We do it. We, we do it. New movie come out. As soon as we see the title, many of us already made a decision whether you're going to see it or not. Amen. Many of us see certain people that are acting, um, that are in the movie. We, we ain't going to see that movie because they have developed such a persona behind the screen that if you saw them in real life, you'd probably be mad at them for just for playing the part. But you never get mad at yourself for playing the part. Always talking about, yeah, thank you for that. We always, we always, always looking at people for what they are not, but we never. Take the time to find who they are and where they come from or what they really about. We've seen people come into the church, and the moment we see them, we've already made a decision about who they are and how we're going to deal with them. We never take the time to embrace and engage and encourage relationship. That's why ministry is so important, because in order for me to serve you, I have to first get a chance to know you. But no, we don't like that approach because we develop a club or a clique mentality yeah. when it comes to what type of treatment I'm going to give you once you get in here. You stink, you look bad, you got all those kids, and you know, your pants sagging, and your pants all cut up. Already I look at you and I see your problem. But we're not learning how to fix stuff but we have it in us to just judge people based on what I see and based on what I see I already know how I'm going to deal with you without developing relationship in the text in the text as we look into the text we see a prime example of someone that right away did not get a chance to get a relationship formed. Matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus passes by and he sees this man who was blind from his birth. And I want you to pay attention to the questioning of the disciples, the church folk now, church folk. We ain't talking about nobody outside Kingdom Kinda. We talk about folks already in here. Folks already in here. And, 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 and the question that comes out their mouth, watch this, Uncle Tang, is not. Did he see him? They jumped past that question and said, who did he? So, so, somebody sinned. You, you, you come out the womb blind. You come out the womb with uh, impairedness. You come out the womb with a problem. You came out the womb like this. Somebody done messed up. I mean, didn't even give them a chance. They didn't go to the man and ask him. They had to go to Pastor Jesus and say, Pastor, something wrong with this. 
Somebody done did something wrong for this boy to get this. And if I can, if I can talk to you real quick just on that, your oversight can determine the poor perception. Amen. Let me do this again because maybe I didn't say that right to you. You overlooking stuff can determine how you look at stuff. These men have walked with Jesus for some time. And they have yet to discern who he is and how to deal with people. Because if they've been around Daddy Ross long enough, they should know how to deal with people. That's what, that's what we think. If I've been around the shepherd long enough, I should know how to deal with people. And what happens, we assume stuff, and because we assume stuff, I ain't going to say what the world say, but we make a rear end out of ourselves by assuming if, if you go back, if you go back in Mark chapter 5, the Bible says that there was a woman that had an issue of blood, and she had went to see doctors and paid her money. She, she, she had her hope in the wrong places. She spent everything that she had, and her matter got worse. But when she heard about Jesus, she did something different to get the result that she needed. When she got it, Jesus felt that power had came out of him. And the disciples, the one that had been around him, said, uh, all these people around you, you asking who touched you? Because church folk can hang around, it don't mean that they in. And it, we have people that have yet, that have learned to took and tap in into the power of God. They have yet to learn how to tap in, to know how to deal with people. They have yet to learn how to tap in on how to get in on what God has for them. These disciples have yet to learn how to tap in. Because instead of embracing, they go right to undiscerning. Based on what they see, that's what they think it is. And, and if I can say this, your, your misdiagnosis can lead to malpractice. Ain't you, if you look at it wrong, you're going to treat it wrong. You see me with my kids running around church, nasty, and you think I just want them that way? I want help, and I don't really know how to receive it because the way you're looking at me. So, be, so because you misdiagnose me, you're going to treat me in a way that I don't need to be treated. And you know, folks get sued for malpractice. Yeah. Folks get sued for malpractice, and you got to be careful on how to deal with people. And if you don't know how to deal with people, leave them. You know what? Let me say it this way. Let me say it this way, because I, I got to bring it to you in the letter that you understand. If you don't know how to deal with people, leave them the hell alone. And many of us, Pastor Ross, many of us, we mean well. We mean well. We, we, we want to try our best to help people. But when you, you, you can overdo it. Or as our young folks say, we be doing the most. We do the most in trying to help them. But because we look at them wrong, we deal with them the wrong way. And when we deal with them the wrong way, we done started something that ends up becoming a mess. So you got to be discerning in your diagnosis. Learn how to engage. Learn how to ask questions. Learn how to embrace and encourage and engage before you start assuming stuff. I can't tell you how to feel. I can't tell you how to act. I can't tell you what to think. I got to learn how to just build a relationship first. But let me show you how Jesus deals with it because even though their oversight brought about a bad outcome, the mess ended up becoming a divine deed. Because after they discerned it wrong, the Bible says in verse 3, Jesus said, this man didn't sin. 
nor his parents. Now, if I'm the parent or the man, I'm relieved. I'm relieved because what I got ain't my fault. I wish I, I wish I could do this the way I What's going on with me, it was not a result of what I did. It, a, it was a result of God showing up to show himself in the world. And many of us, we walk around with these issues and people look at us and when they look at us, they look at us as if we are the issue. But they don't look at us as a person that has an issue. Just like the government look at us and they don't see Ellis, they see a social security number. So they deal with you based on... I wish I had some help in. They, they deal with you as if you're just a case in their folder. But they don't deal with you as a person that has an issue. So now what Jesus does, without directly schooling his disciples, he shows them how to deal with people where they are. Instead of me looking at you as you are the sin. I'm looking at you as a person that has given me an opportunity to show up. Whew, I wish I had some. And there's somebody in the house on the day. You're just an opportunity for God to show up. You, you are just the project that God has been waiting for to show up in a way that he's never shown up before. Quit doubting yourself and looking down on yourself because how people have looked down on you. You are just an opportunity for God to show up. Tell somebody you got to give to some God to work with. You got, you got to give God something to work with. You're probably saying, well, I ain't got no money. I ain't got no car. I ain't got no credit card. But do you got you? The Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice. God said, I just want you. That's all I want. I don't want your money. I don't want your car. I don't need your $100 love offering. I just want you. And you know what? Y'all should be loving on yourself right now. Just hug on yourself that all God wants is me. I'm the best thing that ever happened to God. I'm so glad that God loved me. I got these scars. I got these wounds. I got this bad credit. I got this messed up relationship. This baby daddy don't care nothing about his kids. This baby mama don't care nothing about me. She just want my money. But God want me just as I am because just as I am is not how I'm going to stay. So while the disciples, while the disciples were detecting foul play, divinity said, I'm going to fix this. The disciples said, somebody did something wrong. But divinity said, I'm going to fix this. So instead of you trying to find something wrong, the Jesus in you ought to say, we're going to fix this. Yeah, we're going we to fix this. As we progress, the Bible goes a little bit further. After Jesus made submission of this fact, that I got to do the works of him that sent me for when night coming, no man can work. In other words, the life that I have, this life that God gave me was not meant to play around with. The, what the life that God has given me, he's given it to me so that I can be a blessing to somebody else. So why you think you got all the time to party, smoke, act a fool, be dumb, be stupid? No, that ain't what God gave you a life. He gave you a life so that you can take that life and give it back to him. And that's your gift. Yeah. On how you're going to give it back to God. And we get to verse 6. And when we get to verse 6, the Bible said that after he has spoken, after he basically indirectly checked his disciples, and gave strength to the man that was blind and encouragement to his parents saying that it was not our fault. The Bible says that after he spoke, he spits on the ground, made clay of what came out his mouth, 
and he anoints the eyes of the blind man with clay. Y'all don't see this, but let me see if we can paint the picture. What we saw is nasty. God used it as a way to bring about deliverance. Now watch this, because I'm going to tell you what faith do. I want want y'all to listen now. I want y'all to miss this. While I'm mixing my clay, I want y'all to see this. I want y'all to hear me now. Shh, listen, listen, listen now. I don't want y'all to miss. While I'm mixing my clay with my spit, the man can't see what's going on. I don't see the outcome, but I hear it. I don't know what he's doing, but he's doing something. I hear something. I don't see it, but he's doing something. Don't know how I'm going to get that bugle across. But he doing it. Don't know if I'm going to get this interview. But he doing something. I wasn't even expecting that phone call. But he was doing something. And watch this. Whatever comes out of his mouth, it changes the atmosphere. Because before he spit on the ground, it was just dirt. But after he spit in the ground, it becomes something different to do something different. Now watch this. I know know that's a shouting point. I know that's a shouting point, but that's really not the shouting point. Because you can, you, can, you can put something out there in the atmosphere. It may change the atmosphere, but it don't change the person. You know, the performer said, when he saw people worshiping, something was happening in the atmosphere, but it didn't happen to him. And the reason why it didn't happen to him, because the atmosphere did not get in him. The only way the atmosphere got in him, it had to be applied. The Bible said that after Jesus spits on the ground, mixes it up in the dirt, makes it clay, the Bible said that he anoints the man's eyes. I don't care about how long you've been up in this room this morning. If it ain't on you, ain't nothing going to happen. The only way you're going to get a mosquito off of you got to know that it's on you first. Because you ain't going to react to nothing that ain't going to do nothing to you. I wish I had some help with me. And if it ain't on you, it ain't going to happen. But watch this. Even though he couldn't see it, that didn't stop God from doing his part. And many of us want to see it. And if we don't see it, we ain't going to believe it. Some of y'all came from Missouri and said, I ain't going to believe none until I see it. Well, you got you to show me. And it was just based on me showing you, you wouldn't go nowhere. But the man didn't see the process. 
But he knew the process was doing something. So the master's methods will bring about an omnipotent outcome. Because what came out of his mouth affected the atmosphere, but then he takes the atmosphere and places it on him. Now watch what happens after he takes the atmosphere that came out of his mouth, takes the atmosphere and applies it to his eyes. The Bible says that he tells the man, go. Now that right there just made me mad. Where can you tell a blind man to go? <laughs> Already blind. Then you put most stuff on his eyes and then tell him, go. And not just go, but he told him to go to a specific place. <laughs> I know y'all want to go there, but I ain't ready to go there yet. He tells a blind man that got clay on his eye that already can't see to go to a specific place. Because when the anointing is on you, you don't know what's going on. You just know that something is happening. When there was no anointing, the man couldn't go nowhere. But when the anointing is on you, you got to go somewhere. The Bible said that Jesus tells him to go to the pool. And wash. The Bible don't say that the man had to be assisted. The man does not say that somebody had to grab him by the hand and walk him to the pool. The Bible clearly says that he went his way to the pool and he washed and came seeing. Okay, God, what, 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 what are you saying? What, what are you saying? He puts it on his eyes. He already blind. God said, Jesus said, go to the pool and wash. The man went there blind with clay on his eyes. And he went there without seeing. Y'all shouting about the fact that he came back seeing. I'm shouting about the fact that he went there without seeing. What you think is a problem in your life when God puts the anointing on it, God can make some things happen. Yeah. Why are you waiting on the miracle to happen? The miracle done already happened. You think you got to get better to do better. But God said, I can use you where you are to get what you need to get. So now, he goes there, blind, clay on his eyes, the anointing is on him. He goes, washed, and he comes back seeing. And praise God that he came back seeing. But I want you to know something. Even when God blesses you, folks still going to see you for what you was. And this would disappoint me about church folk because... Folk get delivered, they get set free, they get saved, and you can't look beyond what they was. And many a time they can't look beyond where you were because that's all they got. The Bible says that the neighbors came and they saw the man which was blind. And this is, what they, this is what they said. They said, man, you can see now? No, they ain't say that. Man, you got your sight back? No, they ain't say that. Uncle Dave, they said, was this the same man that was here sitting, begging? This, 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 ain't this the blind one? Every time we got ready to go to the store, he begging for stuff. This is the same one that always out here just bugging people to see if we can get some. This is the same one. People will never let down what you were. 
And watch this. And this is a whole other sermon. I hope, hopefully I can come back and do this one. But many a times, many a times, they can't get past what you was because they have yet got past who they are now. And because they break through and came, they can't see past where they are and figure if I ain't going nowhere, you ain't no better than me. Next time, next time I'll do that. Next time, next time. So they look at this man and say, this is the same man that was sitting here begging blind. That's the same man. Some said, this is he. Others said, he looked just like him. But watch this evangelist Bray. He got ready to do his own testifying service. I love testifying service because can't, can't nobody tell your story like you tell your story. And watch this. You cannot let other people talk down what God did for you. Because they ain't going to tell your story the way you can tell your story. They can be with a monotone voice and just talk about how it is. Oh, yeah, he, got his, he, he was blind like this. He was blind like that. He'd been begging like this. And God did something for him. Praise the Lord. But they didn't have an evangelist break testimony where they know where they came from. They know how hard it was. They don't know the struggle. They don't know the hard time. They don't know how many times I had to beg for a ride. They don't know how many times I had to go Uber. They didn't know how many times I had to catch a taxi. They didn't know how many bus passes with a transfer. They didn't know how many times I had to hit a ride. But when God showed up, can't nobody tell it like I can tell it. Don't let the news from your neighbors triumph your testimony. Don't let what people see you triumph where God brought you from. Don't ever put yourself in a position that no matter how bad or how mono they see you, always think about the fact that God did something for me, and the only way I can tell it, I got to tell it the way I know it needs to be told. You know, we can sit back, we can sit back, and we can talk about what Jesus went through to get us to where he needed us to be. We can talk the gospel story to say that he came to be God with us, show us how the right way to live. We can talk about how he went from judgment hall to judgment hall, how he was betrayed and all that some other. We can talk all about the fact how they whipped him all night long, 40 strikes minus one. We can talk about the 72 thorns that was planted on his head. We can talk about him carrying the cross all the way down to Golgotha and how he was nailed to the cross. And we can talk about that and we just live it down. But we can never tell it the way he lived it. And that's why it's so important for us to embrace our relationship with Christ. Because even though we wasn't there, our faith takes us to Calvary. To remind us of the sacrifice that he did for us. And if we can tell somebody how wonderful and how great Jesus was when it came to us going to hell. But because he came and stepped in on our behalf so that we can one day have a relationship with God. Then we can tell it the way that need to be told. So even though your situation may look bad. Even though things look tough right now, it seems like you're by yourself doing this. Just look at your situation. Think about how Jesus stepped in and brought clarity to your confusion. And when you see how God did it for somebody else, now you can look at your situation and say, you know what? Things ain't always what they say. And there may be someone here on today, you, your story been told wrong for so long that all you wanted was an opportunity for, to tell your story. All you ever wanted 
was for somebody to meet you where you was so that you can get the help that you needed. Let this invitation be the invitation that can help you get started in telling your story the right way. Your story does not have to end that my mama did something wrong. That's why I'm like this. Your story don't have to end that my daddy left and treated us this way. That's why I'm like this. Your story can be this is where I am. And this is how I want God to fix it. This could be your invitation. Forget about what everybody else said. They, they don't matter. They never did. The only reason that they matter because you gave them power to matter. But God said the only story that matters is the one that ends that I died that you may live. That I gave up the best that I have so that you can have my best. It looks bleak. It looks sad. It looks messed up. I understand that. But God said your story can change today when you allow him to do something that may seem nasty to you. But it's a miracle in the making. Let God take his spit. And let him anoint your life. For the better. Is there one that has yet to come to Christ? Accept him as Lord and Savior. Allow him to be Lord and rule over your life. Allow him to bring about the change you've always wanted but never knew it could happen. But maybe you have the relationship but you don't have the place to grow and develop. Allow Kingdom Connection to be that church that can embrace you, that can encourage you, that can help you to get to that place where God desires you to be. Quit thinking about the fact that you're not perfect. Quit thinking about the fact that you're human. No, you are a spiritual being that has human experiences. And you just need someone to care enough to show you that your story don't have to end here. Is there one? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, the invitation has been given. We see there's number that's always from. Let's praise God all over the building. <laughs> praise God for his word. Amen. Amen.